Hello! So in this video, we're going to be looking at a practical example of using multiprocessing in Python. So if any of you have seen my videos in the past, you know that I'm quite partial to creating animations, whether that be animated GIFs or simply movies. And quite often in my videos, I will use the matplotlib plotting library. Why do I use matplotlib? Well, to be honest, it produces very nice looking plots. There are plenty of Python plotting libraries out there, but matplotlib really produces the best looking ones, in my opinion. Now, the one problem with matplotlib is that it's quite slow. So matplotlib is not renowned for being a fast plotting library. So there are plotting libraries out there that can do it quicker. But again, I don't think they look anywhere near as good as what matplotlib can do. And so quite often in the video, I'm stuck in a situation like this. So I might have some data that I want to plot. Let's go ahead and plot this. So I've got a simple script that's basically reading in some data and then it's going to produce some plots. I go ahead and run that. You can see I'm generating figure after figure after figure. If we take a look at these figures, we see that each figure is basically an individual animation frame. So each figure is showing the time progression of an activity plot. So on the left here, I basically have thread number. On the bottom here, I have time. And what's happening is that each one of these plots is a different animation frame in which the time is being incremented. The basic idea is you create, if you create enough of those and then run them, you get something like this. A nice, smooth animation. Now, the reason I do it like this, so I plot, I generate the individual image frames and then go ahead and combine them into a movie outside of Python. The reason I do that is because it gives you more freedom. And so let's just take a deeper dive into what this is doing. But I have my setup here where I just import all the relevant modules that I need to actually be able to make the plot. I set some global style parameters, such as using the dark background. And then I have my main guard here. So we don't actually need this for this example, but in the next example we do, so I'll keep it. But the basic idea is we read in some data. What does data look like? Well, after a bit of manipulating, the data is something like this. So it's a table with thread and time as an index, and then the number of function calls and activity as the column. So what this is doing is for each element of time, so the time can be thought of as bins on a histogram, it's logging how many times a function was called during that time interval in nanoseconds. So it's split into 50 microsecond intervals, and then it's saying how many times the function was called during those intervals, and it's tracking that for each thread. If this value is ever non-zero, so if we scroll down, we see that the activity is true. So even though the function called may differ, see 11, 33, 32, we just want to know whether there was activity, and that's basically what this plot is showing. It's showing that whenever a thread actually did something, so whenever the function was called, it basically just logs that down. So it's an activity plot against thread. What we then go and do is then I create some plot parameters. I say I want to do 200 frames in total. In reality, I'm going to be doing something more like 3,600 because that's 60 frames per second for 60 seconds. That's 3,600 frames. But for this example, let's do 200. I've also created two variables here, start and stop. So that's telling me start at frame zero and go to frame 200. I then do some data manipulation, get the times, etc. And then here I have just a for loop that basically loops over this end frame start and end frame stop. And it creates a brand new figure each time, populates the figure with the relevant data, sets up the axes, etc. And then importantly at the end, saves it into a folder called frames. If I look inside the folder, we see I have a folder called frames. Go inside there, you can see it's generating individual image frames. And these are what would be combined together to create the movie. And now at the bottom here, I've just done some timing for this function. So let's go ahead and run this, and then we'll wait a bit. And you see that once we open 20 figures, we start getting warnings, saying more than 20 figures have been opened, figures created through pipeline interface are retained until blah, 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 blah. Nobody cares. What you see is that it will slowly increase my memory usage as well. The easiest way to get rid of that is in the code. You include a plot.close figure and it will close it down, freeing a bit of memory. Anyway, as we continue going, you can see we're only up to plot 50, 61 at the moment. So we've still got a long way to go. So I'll fast forward now. And so we're almost finished, 95%. Eight more frames to go. And there we have it. 
and it tells us at the bottom that we generated 200 frames in 168 seconds, which is around 1.2 frames per second. That's quite long. So if I actually wanted to go ahead and do my 3600 frames, which I would actually like to do, this would take around 50 minutes. So that's quite a long time to actually be waiting for these animations to generate. And typically in some of my videos, I have upwards of 10 animations that I need to generate. So I really can't be waiting 10 hours for all the frames to be generated. Now, one option would be on the matplotlib animation would be to stream that directly into FMPEG and make a movie. I personally don't like that because I feel that the FFmpeg writer as part of matplotlib doesn't give you access to enough of the options that I would actually like. Whereas if you save the frames in PNG, you get lossless quality and then you can make whatever you like from them, whether it's GIFs, whether it's movies, whatever you like with them. So it gives you a lot more freedom. And when you think about it, places like Disney and DreamWorks will just be generating the frames and then putting the movie together post-process. And so is there anything we can do to speed this up? So let's close down all these figures. So the easiest way and the way that I more often do it is to do something like this. So what I've done here is I've moved all of the code required to make the plot into a function called plotter. And then importantly at the top, I send it the data and then I send it these three variables, n0, n1, nt. So all it's going to do is say n0 and n1 now become our indices that we'd like to plot. So for example, n0 could be zero, nt could be 200. So I'm saying plot frames zero to 200 with a total number of frames as specified here. So this could be 3,600. Let's try that. Let's do 3,600 here. And so by doing zero to 200, we'd be plotting 1 18th of the total number of frames. So why is that useful? Well, down here in my main function now, you see it's been heavily reduced, but I do something like this. So I give it total number of frames that I want in my animation. So again, we'll do 200 for this example, so we can compare the timings. But now I go ahead and say, okay, I want this many plotters. Okay, so what's a plotter? If we scroll down, so I do the same thing. I load in the data because Loading in the data might be a very big operation, and then particularly if you're then manipulating the data, let's pretend that that takes a long amount of time. What you don't want to be doing is doing that for every single thread that we're going to be running, or every single process that we're going to be running. What we do is want to manipulate the data once, and then go ahead and distribute the plotting. And then we go ahead and open a pool object, which comes from the multiprocessing pool class. And then all we do here is we create an iterable, and what the iterable is, it's just a list of tuples where we have our data as our first element and then we have three elements after it with each one being n0, n1 and nt in the plotter function. So what's this saying? It's saying that this first element of the list is going to be the data and then frame 0 to 12. Second element is going to be data and then frames 12 to 15 etc etc it goes all the way to the end until we reach frame 200. It split the plotting into 16 individual tasks where the function only has to plot frame 0 to 12, 12 to 15, 25 to 37 etc. But we're then using a multiprocessing pool star map which basically will send these individual iterable arguments into this function at the top but it will do it in parallel. So it's creating individual processes and then sending those jobs to the process. So each one of those process will go ahead and actually plot those frames that is given. So we'll actually be creating multiple frames at once. Go ahead and run that and I'll bring up the file, the folder called frames. You see, there's a bit of lag at first, nothing's happening, but then all of a sudden it starts to be populated. And that looks a lot faster than 1.2 frames per second. And what you'll find is that each of these is doing in chunks. So remember these chunks are about 13 elements, uh, 12 elements large. So what you'll see is that you would get frame 0, frame 12, frame 25, etc. all being generated at once. And then frame 2, and then frame 13, and then frame 26, etc. And you see it's already done. That's now saying it generated 200 frames in 20.5 seconds, which is around 9.8 FPS. So it is indeed a lot faster. So I've generated the same number of frames in around an eighth of the time, so it's around eight times faster. And that kind of makes sense because my computer is a eight core 16 thread machine. Eight physical cores means I can get realistic scaling up to around eight times. And then the, the 16 threads is the simultaneous multithreading technology. It doesn't mean you get double the processing power. It's more like 25%. But again, the operating system in the background has to do stuff. And the threads themselves have some overhead associated with sending the data. But in general, 
that's around 8 times faster. Whereas before it was taking around 50 minutes to generate all my frames, it would now only take around 6 minutes. So that's a massive saving, especially if I'm doing 10 videos at once that I need to generate frames for. I can do it in closer to an hour instead of 8 hours. So the, the time savings really speaks for themselves, and I think this is quite a nice example of an actual practical example of multiprocess in Python. The other option to do this, and this is sometimes what I do as well, is that I will actually put some arguments in the function. So if things like sister arg D, I might do something like this. I would check if they if I received any arguments from the sister arg V. And then you could go ahead and do sys.arg V. And then you can start setting elements such as n0 equals the first element, n1, nt, etc, etc with the zeroth element being the file name itself. And then you go ahead and run that from the command line with the appropriate number of arguments, and that's fine. But for this particular example, I think multiprocessing is better for the simple reason that when you do it this way, and if you were to call this script, say 16 times, it would actually be loading in the data 16 times. And if the data is very big, or you have the hard drive is very slow, I know that doesn't happen a lot these days, or if the data operation is particularly intensive, which it actually can be, then that approach does have a bit more of the overhead associated with it, with actual manipulation of data. Whereas this one, I'm keeping the plot, literally just the plotting is being done inside the function. And so these background processes are literally just creating the frames. And that's literally what happens in movie rendering farms. And then when you've created these movie frames, you can go ahead and do a bash script. Or in my case, I'm in Windows, so I use batch file. I'll choose a batch file to launch ffmpeg with some arguments to go ahead and make a nice movie. And the advantage of this is that in this one command, I could generate both an mp4, an animated gif, etc. Or mp4s in many different sizes, perhaps add an audio track, whatever you want. This gives you maximum freedom because the frames are there, perfect quality, lossless compression. And so I hope you found this mildly interesting. So I thought it would just be good to give you a sort of behind the scenes of how I tend to do all of my videos that obviously take quite a long time to actually save. And I will put this source code on my GitHub link in the description below. And so thanks for watching.